task in motion planning for robots in the real world. Uh, one announcement is that Sachin couldn't make it. Um, and so the part that was going to be on belief space planning, we'll make the slides available. And uh, I'll cover the part that's going to be on non or sorry, deterministic, fully observable situations. Um, and there's plenty of time, so just interrupt me if you don't follow something or if I say something that seems totally wrong. Okay, so let's start at the beginning where we had this wonderful robot called Shaky. And oh, the audio isn't coming. That's too bad. Mm. So that was triangle tables, if you recognized it. And the funny thing here is that Shaky was quite a primitive system. But the key aspect there, the informal explanation is still true, that the task that we want these robots to solve even now may seem simple, pick, pick up an object, and so on. But it still requires very complex reasoning. And Shaky was something like an anachronism, it had the, this was its manipulator. It would just push things. It had some feelers to detect. And that was the peripheral you could type and give it instructions and so on. But then it had Wi-Fi. So it was surprisingly modern. Um, OK, so since Shaky, however, um, planning in robotics has separated out into two very rich areas of research. There's task planning and there's motion planning. And to solve real problems, like uh, setting the table for dinner, for instance, you want to solve both of, or you want to use both of these methods. Because task planning focuses on figuring out long-term strategies. Like, should I use the tray to lay out the table? Or should I just move everything one by one? And the input uh, of a task planning problem can still contain something very much like a strips description from Shaky which has the initial state of some kind of a goal specification and actions in a very logic -y language. And then we have the lower level of planning, or motion planning, which is to actually figure out which space of configurations or sequence of configurations to go through to actually do a particular movement. Right? And the input here consists of initial and target configurations of the robot, which can be arbitrarily high-dimensional vectors. So for the PR2, they are 20-dimensional vectors. And to solve the real problem, you need to do both, because without motion planning, your robot doesn't move. And without task planning, it doesn't know where to move. Right? So um, task planning and motion planning has evolved. And there have been lots of advances. Task planners are now very good at finding action sequences, and particularly through methods for automatically constructing heuristics. So they're domain-independent guided search planners. That's very good, but they're not directly applicable to continuous state and action spaces. And we'll see some of the reasons why. Motion planners, on the other hand, have also evolved. So they primarily used, uh, use random sampling techniques to search in high dimensional continuous, or, uh, continuous state spaces. But they're not very easy to apply for discrete sequencing problems. So we need to apply both task planning and motion planning, and this is where the need for combined task and motion planning comes in. So the overview of this talk, first I'll start with some background on sampling-based motion planning. I won't go into too many technical details, but enough so that you all know what the low-level planner is going to do. Um, then we'll see some of the problems that come up if we just do task planning to compute a plan and then execute it. We'll see why that's not a feasible solution. 
And then we'll focus on approaches for task and motion planning. So first, I'll look at two examples that are really just extensions of motion planning algorithms. And then we'll look at a bunch of approaches which are more recent and uh, do a more advanced form of logical reasoning. And then this was a bridge to Sachin's uh, portion of the talk, so we're not going to go there too much in detail. But uh, I'll still say what makes uh, partial observability interesting. And what I'm not going to cover here too much is software architectures, that is how to actually build your uh, planning system, or domain and task specific approaches. For instance, there are approaches which are specifically designed to pick up an object from a cluttered environment. And yeah. Um, so, so there are a few planners that do handle continuous variables, like mm -hmm. Colin, for example. Mm -hmm. So can you say a few words about why they're not good enough to plan robot mode? Yeah, yeah. So we'll see that, actually. So during the motion planning section, and then just after that, if I still haven't answered your question, right. you can come back to it. Any other questions? Okay, so, so I won't go too much into task-specific approaches, but if you have a situation where your robot just has to most, or 80% of the time, just pick up things from cluttered surfaces, then definitely you want to look at those kind of approaches. Okay, so let's begin by looking at what motion planning is all about. So here are some examples of motion planning problems. This is the popular alpha puzzle, where you can treat this as a motion planning problem. It is a motion planning problem. You have two objects. That's the initial state or initial configuration. And that's the final configuration where you've separated them. Right? And your uh, motion planning problem is to find out uh, continuous paths from all these, connecting all these configurations and reaching the separated state. And you, there are lots of examples of motion planning in uh, industrial settings where you have these robots that must repeatedly do the same kind of operations, but they have to be extremely precise. So you want to pr find a motion plan for going into going through these uh, constrained regions without colliding something, colliding with something, and scratching up your car's paint or whatever. So that's the. Uh, kind of problems that you want to solve in general with motion planning. And the way you do that is by formalizing a configuration space. Okay? So given any robot, which is some kind of an assembly of links, you can have various kinds of joints, you want to specify the exact configuration of that robot. So for this thing treated as a robot, you need just two uh, parameters, theta1 and theta2, and that will give you the exact configuration of this assembly. For something like an aeroplane over there, you need the x, y, z to tell you where in space it is, and then the three solid angles to tell you what the orientation of the aircraft is. So that's six dimensional. And if you go all the way up to a PR2, you have a 20 dimensional configuration of the robot. That's required to specify each joint in, uh, each joint in the arms, the base, and the head, and so on. Okay. So the motion planning problem is given two configurations of a system and the kind of degrees and the, and the kind of motion that's possible at each joint. You want to find a path that links the two configurations in the configuration space. So for instance, you can have a workspace description like this, where you have your robot like a rectangle, that's your obstacle, let's say. You can convert that to a configuration space and here, what you do is just convert your robot to a point and grow the obstacles so that if the point is situated in any of the free zones that is outside this blue area, blue area then you know that the robot is not going to collide with the obstructions. Okay? So in general, constructing the configuration space in this way is arbitrarily complex. It can be very difficult. You, your robot can be something like this, and then the configuration space is some... Uh, some kind of a description in a very high dimensional uh, space. Okay, so instead of computing the exact obstacle boundaries in the configuration space, what sampling based motion planning approaches do is to randomly sample configurations. Okay, and we look at two approaches for, uh, uh, for sampling based motion planning in this domain. So we have probabilistic roadmaps and RRTs, or random, ra rapidly exploring random trees. 
Okay? In both of these, you simply need to know whether or not the robot is in collision, so you don't have to build the configuration space up front. Okay, so let's look at PRMs. Um, so let's say this is your configuration space, and it's something that the algorithm doesn't know a priori. So you begin by sampling a bunch of configurations. Right? So let's say that's our uniform sample of configurations. Then for each of these samples, we throw away the configurations that are in collision. And that can be checked. It's a much more easier problem than building the exact configuration space. So we throw away the, the configurations that are not in collision. We get the space of feasible configurations. And now we start building a roadmap. Right? So by that, what we mean is take a vertex and try to connect it to its nearest neighbors. And you can use various data structures for dynamically storing and computing what the nearest neighbors of some vertex are. So you compute these edges and then find out if the edges are intersecting with any of the collisions. Right? So that's the second thing you need. The first is to determine whether or not a configuration intersects with some obstacle. And the second is whether or not a path intersects with an obstacle. So you throw away those edges and continue this process until you sort of connect the entire space of sample configurations. So that gives you a roadmap. And this is a roadmap because it's not just answering one motion planning query. You can use this graph to find a path between any two configurations that you have here. Okay, So you could, of course, you might have a different thing, a different configuration that you add to this uh, graph, and then you want to connect it up again, and you're Motion planning problem is basically a search problem in this graph. So you can go ahead and find the paths. And that's how PRMs work. So to recap, you first randomly sample configurations in the C space, and then you use two kinds of primitive queries. Check whether a configuration is in free space and check if an edge is in free space. If you have those two, then you can repeat this cycle of connecting things, removing edges that are in collision, and so on. Yeah. The best finding problem, but well, what is it for a, a Right. That can, uh... So it is still a path, but in a very high dimensional space. So it's typically a time index trajectory, like a sequence of configurations that the robot should go through. So yeah, it, it when can I say be very really high. Just the edge, right? What's an edge in the. Right. So edge is just the shortest path or any path that you can find to reach that target configuration. So, so it's just I mean, a straight line, right? Or oh, this is just a graph representation of it, yes. Yeah, I was just trying to see what would be a straight line. The straight line, the bits, the, mm -hmm. the component of the path when you had, I don't know, um, a robot that has, I don't know, right. crazy thing in its arm. It's just like a... Right, so it would be something like a parameterized trajectory. So for every control point, for every joint, you would say, here's my function as a... Um, as a function of the time sort of parameter. And this is how the joint should evolve. So it has to include the complete. It's sort of like just one piece of the path, too. Yeah. yeah. So in practice, uh, most motion planners sort of uh, grow it in stages by applying random control inputs and growing it. But actually, that brings us to the other uh, motion planning algorithm, which is rapidly exploring random trees. So often, if you're trying to connect all these edges to points uh, in your configuration space, what can happen is there are very few connections between the points that you've sampled randomly. And that can be because of dynamic constraints. For example, if your robot is a car, you can't just move sideways. You have to do some kind of a weird motion. And it's not always even possible to find a path between two configurations. So. What you want to do instead is try to grow the map as far as you can. So don't build the complete edge, but try to grow it. So this is what RRTs do. Um, the basic idea is sim similar. You start with your starting and goal nodes. And this time, you're not building a roadmap. You're answering a specific query. So you have your starting configuration, and you have a goal configuration. And in each iteration, you try to expand your, uh, your connected component towards the goal. So this is what you do. You sample a vertex, and then 
find the nearest, so let's say, let's see we sampled uh, this vertex, we find the nearest vertex to this sampled vertex in the existing graph and then try to grow an edge from here to the sampled vertex. And the important thing is you need to have this extend routine which will take the edge as far as it can in the direction that you need to go. And so if there was an obstacle here, that edge would have just stopped at the obstacle. So it's still expanding. Okay, and then we keep repeating this operation until we reach the goal. So RRTs actually have this kind of a, a fractal-like structure because every time it's trying to grow an edge, it goes as far as it can towards the obstacle. So you see all these paths that are curving around the obstacles and so on. Okay. Okay, so that's the, those are the two kinds of motion planning algorithms that most of the planners that we look at uh, focus on. So like task planning, in motion planning also completeness is important and it has similar definitions that a motion planner is complete if and only if it will find a collision free path when there exists one. Okay? But because these are sampling based motion planners which keep doing the process as you give them more and more time, the notion of probabilistic completeness becomes more interesting. And here we say that the probability that a planner will find a feasible path, if there exists one, approaches one as you increase the number of samples. So this is something that almost all the task planners that try to be complete will exploit. So most complete task and motion planners are probabilistically complete. <coughs> okay, and um, one interesting thing is that PRMs and RRTs work well in practice because they have, most domains in practice have some good visibility properties. That is, from every point, there is a good fraction of the environment that is, vis that is visible that you can reach. Right. Okay, so with that as the basic stuff on motion planning, let's look at how we can actually build a complete or a combined task and motion planner. Actually, let me just uh, stop this for a minute. Yeah, okay. Okay, so recall that we, re we have this situation where task and motion planners are independently very good at sort of complementary problems. And so if you want to build a robot and have it uh, solve real tasks, you might think that the best thing to do is, okay, first let me use a task planner, produce a plan, and then take each action in that plan, convert that action to a motion plan, stitch them together, and you basically get a complete solution, right? It's something that your robot should be able to execute. It turns out that this is, this is not going to be that easy. And to see why, let's go back to the blocks world, right? In planning, this is boring. Most planners will solve these kind of problems very easily, and um, we, we've more or less reached a level of confidence with blocks world problems. But it turns out that if you look at any real robotics uh, work, most of the time they're doing pick and place tasks. Take an object from here, put it there. Laying out the table is a pick and place task, right? But pick and place tasks are just versions of the blocks world, but nobody actually uses a task planner to solve those problems. And why, right? If we are so confident about our task planners, why doesn't anybody use them? Turns out there's a good reason. This kind of a specification doesn't really consider the geometric locations of the robot or the hand or uh, the object. And it doesn't say anything about geometric preconditions, right? For now, assume that we don't have any stacking. Even then, this is not sufficient. And to see why, let's look at a slightly more realistic version of the problem. It's still 2D, so it's imaginary, but it's more realistic in the sense that now we have these geometric locations of the objects and there's a gripper, right? And what the gripper needs to do to pick up something in this domain is just go and align itself to an edge, okay? Now, as you can see here, it cannot reach, reach object one, so the gripper cannot grasp object one. But this actually depends on the exact poses of the two blocks, where they are geometrically. If the gripper was, in, for instance, upside down and on top in that enclosure, it could have easily gone and picked up object one. So 
to express this domain accurately, we need to add additional arguments. We need to say, OK, the uh, pickup action has the object as its argument. And then in addition, it has these poses, p1, p2, and p3. Right? What are these? These are the poses of the object, uh, the pose that you want to be at if you want to pick up the object, and the initial pose of the gripper. Right? And also, another argument is the path, because that's also in the control of the agent. So it's an action argument here. Right? And now, if you include all those things as argument, you can actually write down a complete specification of the pickup action here. So you have is grasping pose that tells you, OK, this is a pose that's close to the block. And then you have this obstruction thing, which is saying that, OK, nothing is obstructing the path. Okay, so this is what you need to actually express the 2D blocks world accurately. And it seems like, OK, this is the um, problem. And now we've solved it because we've expressed everything accurately. And this is actually getting to the answer of Erez's question earlier. The problem with this kind of a specification now is you have an infinite branching factor. That's what numeric planners don't address. And then you have these infinitely many facts because is grasping pose and obstructs, these uh, predicates take continuous arguments. So to even write an initial state, you need to compute all those values. Right? So one standard solution for these kinds of problems is to okay, go ahead and discretize the problem space. So we can say that um, let's take this x and y thing. And we add 10 points in each and discretize. Then even with this simple kind of a problem, if we have just five objects, we are going to end up with about 50,000 facts in the initial state. Because we have to consider all possible paths right, that don't loop over themselves and figure out whether or not there's an obstruction in them for one given state. So the initial state representation itself is hard for that problem. If we look at the PR2, then we end up having to pre-compute 10 to the 14 facts, right? And then if we try to solve this problem where we are trying to pick up that red object, it's going to be, you know, it's going to take forever just to create the initial state. So we cannot really use that discretization approach. So is this clear? This is the main reason why we need to solve combined task and motion planning uh, in a manner different from just task planning followed by motion planning. Any questions so far? OK. OK, so uh, let's look at what people have done on solving these kind of problems. And to begin, I'm going to look at basically extensions of motion planning algorithms themselves. So the first system here in this, in this category is uh, Asimov. And this was developed, I think, between 2003 to 2009. Um, and the idea is to build upon the basic PRM idea. Okay? So the key challenge is that when you have a domain where the robot can pick up objects or put down objects, you basically have different versions of the robot or different versions of the configuration space. Right? Because every time you pick up something, you get a new robot. Now its configuration space has changed. Every time you put something down, you get a different configuration space. So, the solution idea here was to maintain different projected versions of the PRMs that you could reuse and that you could stitch together to find a path. Okay. And so, for instance, if you picked up an object, then you would start using the PRM for the, for the picked up object. Right? And this part really requires no high-level reasoning. So the only place high-level reasoning or task planning came in in this approach was to generate a heuristic to find out how to expand the PRM. Okay? So we'll, we'll see this in more detail. So here's an example of a problem in the Asimov specification. So you have this object, and it, the object has an orientation. Okay? So you start up with the object facing uh, the wall, and you want it to end, you want the planner to produce a plan that ends up in this final configuration. So if you see that, you basically have to pick up the object, bring it out somewhere, then go around, pick it up from the other side, and then take it to the wall. Okay? So the PRM now consists of these different components. The gray ones here are transfer roadmaps. These are roadmaps where the uh, robot has grasped the object. So they're disconnected because 
these two regions correspond to different grasps of the object. So this is, in some sense, this corresponds to a different robot, that corresponds to a different robot, and both of these have uh, basically two opposite grasps. Right? And then we have transit roadmaps where the robot is moving without anything. Okay? So this is the initial configuration of the robot. It can reach this point in the transit roadmap, which is just the roadmap of the robot. Forget about everything else. Right? And in some of those configurations, it can do a grasp action, which will make it transfer to, uh, to the transfer roadmap. Because the only thing that's different between this point G as belonging to this, uh, the transit roadmap and the transfer roadmap is that, OK, it's grasped or ungrasped. There's no geometric difference. Right? So you want to find a plan which first gets the robot to go from the initial pose to this, po this pose where it has grasped the object. Then you want it to drop off the object at some point, go around, grasp it from the other end, and then transfer the object. Okay. So that's the intuitive idea that we want to exploit. Now, formally, Asimov represents its states as a tuple. So you have a geometric component and a continuous component. Okay for any state. And then you have these location predicates. For example, P means place. So that's a location predicate. And this is really just a proposition. In fact, all the predicates are going to be just propositions in this. So uh, P forklift, crank grasp, C box means that you are in, the, um, in a road map for the forklift where at a configuration where it can grasp the C box. Okay, so that specifies a set of configurations. And for any state, you can basically make, uh, have this R relation or R function, which takes a predicate and gives you the configuration space for that predicate. So this is going to be all configurations where B1 is on the table. And then you can extend it to define a state right, as the intersection of all properties that hold in that state. OK, so all this says how a abstract state corresponds to a subset of the configuration space. Now we need to define what happens when you apply an action in the abstract state, right? And here we'll see that there's a very loose semantic linking between the uh, PDDL or task level logic and the low level geometry. So let's say that you have a state S which has these two components. W is the symbolic part, W sharp is the concrete part, okay? Now let's say when you apply an action, you end up at this symbolic state W prime, right? So for both of those states, you can construct the geometric, uh, um, sorry, the configuration space subsets, right? So you have uh, the space of configurations corresponding to W here to W prime here. And basically to find out what the real effect of A, A sharp is on the state S, you extend the roadmap from any configuration in R of W, and you extend that until it intersects with R of W prime. Right? So this region in the intersection is defined as the geometric effect of applying the symbolic action A on the joint state S. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. So so if you notice here, it's the the semantic linking is weak because you can have a W, a state W, which satisfies A's preconditions. And you get some W prime here, which is non-empty, but the reachable set here doesn't have to be intersect at all because it's a PRM and um, it, this region need not be reachable at all. There's no assumption made that A sharp of S always has to be non-empty when A is uh, applicable. And the approach still works. So here's an example very much like uh, PDDL of how you would specify a action in Asimov. The basic precondition is that, okay, your forklift needs to be at a position where it can grasp something. And the effects are saying that, okay, you can no longer grasp C-box because you've grasped it. And C-box is not in any place anymore. It's with the robot. And this guy is basically saying what the new roadmap is. So it's saying that, okay, now you have to use the roadmap of forklift composed with C-box, uh, and you're in the region of that roadmap where you can ungrasp. So that's how you would specify 
an action effect here. So given the states and actions, we now still need a search algorithm. Right? So this is what Asimov does when it is doing a search. Basically, it's going to maintain a tree of symbolic states. And for each symbolic state, it maintains a set of sampled candidate configurations that belong to that symbolic state. Okay? And then there are two forms of expansions, node expansions you can do given the state space. You can either apply an action A at the logical level and see if A of W prime, uh, sorry, A of W, W prime is valid. That is, if it has any valid configurations. If it does, that's fine. Otherwise, at the later stage, you can come back and re-expand the state by expanding the PRM. So basically, what you would do is, given that kind of a situation where you're considering the application of A on a state, W, you keep growing the roadmap until you find an intersection. And that's where you say, OK, I've validated this action application. Now I can try a different expansion. Okay. So we still need a heuristic to figure out which state to expand. What I described just now is only the two kinds of edges that you can add in the graph. And this is where task planners come in. So what the Asimov approach does is compute a heuristic function. And in that heuristic function, the first component is the length of the task plan used to, which can be used to solve the state that you would get if you applied the action. So it's a very loose uh, representation of the utility of a symbolic plan. And then there are other components which have to do with how hard it is to refine the rest of the plan. But they are also just used as metrics or just numbers as inputs to the heuristic. OK, so let's look at a more detailed example of uh, Asimov in action. So here is a domain where you have two robots, forklift one and forklift two, and two boxes, flat box and big box. Now, each of them has their own independent roadmaps, which are really just projections. So you could find a path in the independent roadmaps that doesn't correspond to anything in the joint configuration space. But that's just a heuristic anyway. So you take uh, your partial roadmap for forklift 2. And let's say that the heuristic suggested that you need to apply the action go to. Right? So you keep expanding this roadmap until you reach a node where you validate the next state that's supposed to be there. So if you had to go to and grasp, the next uh, state that you needed to end up in was a situation where this property uh, can grasp the box held. So you keep expanding until that holds. Then you go ahead and you expand the grasp action, which just says, OK, I grasp the robot, so there is no roadmap for it. And then you need to try go to a different you need to apply the next go to action, which has a different effect. And then you expand the roadmap again until you reach a point where you validate the ungrasped predicate, which is a result of this go to action. Right? So, sorry, you need to validate the precondition for the ungrasped predicate. OK. Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. So, in, in uh, classical planning, Mm -hmm. But when you do motion planning, you really have no idea how much it will cost. Yes. So how do you handle that? So this approach actually does everything in the motion planning level. It doesn't do a search at the high level. Oh. So it's doing the opposite. It's assuming that the cost estimate is coming from the logical distance in some sense. So we'll see some approaches which handle cost, but most of the task and motion planning approaches actually don't handle cost. They just produce satisfying plans. OK, so here are a couple of examples of uh, Asimov in action. So this is the standard Towers of Hanoi problem. And it goes ahead and finds this particular plan, where it uh, starts by moving the green to the right and the yellow block to the middle. And that's really the only interesting thing here, because the rest of it is straightforward. It just solves the problem. Now, one particularly interesting part about task in motion planning is if you include geometric uh, changes like that obstruction, your plan completely changes. Now it can no longer put the yellow block in the middle because if it does, it cannot transfer. It cannot go across. So it starts by putting the green block in the middle. 
and then has a totally different plan for the rest of the situation. Okay, you can see how hard it is to actually solve that problem with the obstruction. And this time it could go through, so it decided to and it solved it. So this is something that we'll encounter again and again. When you change something in the geometry, the task plan completely changes. Okay, so to summarize uh, what we saw with Asimov, we basically need a per action specification of the PRM. So for every action, like a go to or pick up, we need to say, okay, this is the PRM that uh, you need to solve. And that includes uh, basically a specification of what the initial configuration is, what the goal configuration is. Right? Um, and you do need a PRM for each object and each robot object grasp. Um, you need something like a candidate configuration generator for each uh, location predicate. And finally, you need some PDDL specifications to guide the uh, search process as a heuristic. Now, in all the approaches that we'll see, actually, all, or in almost all, they, we'll need some, some subroutines that translate a geometric configuration into a set of logical facts. So I'm not going to mention that after this uh, approach. Okay. So the key properties here are that one, it's probabilistically complete. So that's desirable. If you give it more time, it's eventually going to find a solution. It does make minimal assumptions on the semantics and that's both good and bad. It's good because you don't have to be too concerned. Your problem, your solution is going to be found regardless of what you say about the implementations of actions. Uh, but that also is a is not so desirable because your high level reasoning is not going to be that accurate. Um, to improve performance, you could do a greater utilization of task plans here, as well as um, get the task planner to utilize some of the information that you gain by geometric reasoning. At present, the information flow is just one way. The task planner produces a plan and you compress it into a heuristic and use that to expand the PRM. Okay, so in all the approaches that uh, I'll talk about, I'll try to present this kind of a summary so there's a clear idea of what, uh, what inputs are and what the key properties are and so on. And we can look at this at a higher level as well. Uh, we, we saw that this planner Asimov had a single search space. It was just doing search in the configuration space. It actually used the task planner only for the heuristics. Um, at the high level reasoning, it can use any task planner, but at the low level, it's a bit committed to using PRMs or RRTs, right? It doesn't need a numeric planning specification at the high level, so that's good. You can use any uh, task planner, and the high-level language it's using is basically PDDL. Okay, so let's move on to the next approach, and actually the only other approach that we look at for uh, which extends motion planning algorithms. Okay, so here we are. Um, uh, looking at probabilistic tree of roadmaps, or PTRs, which is uh, basically similar to Asimov, but tries to break away from the dependence on PRMs, and generalizes a few concepts, and uh, uses a totally different kind of an input specification at the high level. Okay. So now what we are doing is, in the precondition, we can include some motion planning queries, like this one. So the notation is not very intuitive here, Basically, we are saying for the pickup action, you want to solve the query in the transit roadmap. That's the same notation from Asimov. Um, and this is the robot initial pose, and this is the final pose. So you want to solve that roadmap. That's just being specified here. And then in the preconditions, you have some pose constraints. These are external geometric functions. So if the planner, if there were a planner to solve this, it would have to actually go ahead and execute pose uh, to figure out this is going to be the object's pose if object I were grasped by a robot in pose QD and so on. 
and G is the grasp that it would execute. So these properties, the pose and the grasp stable predicate, actually constrain the set of continuous arguments that you could use in the action because the preconditions have to be specified, uh, have to be satisfied. Okay, and that's the main use of this kind of a specification in PTRs. You basically restrict the space of arguments based on the precondition. Yeah. So I see that you have primitive commands. Right. Right. Move right. So it's probably a bad idea, but why not uh, plan in the space of these primitive actions? Yeah, you could do that as well. Um, here, this. <coughs> As we'll see, the entire planning or search here is going to happen at a low level anyway. So once you execute this query, you get a motion plan, and this guy is just saying, move along that and close your gripper. So, so, so it's like a macro. Oh, yeah. it's, it's like a macro with, uh, yeah, with geometric uh, preconditions. Yep. Any other questions? OK. So the main idea in the search algorithm is to do some kind of daisy chaining. And that's actually what PRMs, or sorry, Asimov was also doing. But here it's a much uh, clearer version of the same thing. So what we do is start with our initial configuration, right? And then start adding edges for actions. And again, which edges do we add? We add the edges for which the preconditions are satisfied. And then, so you see those dotted edges there. That means that you've added a node, but you still haven't found a full path in the PRM for that action. So incrementally, what you do is every time you alternate between adding new nodes and spending more time in uh, answering the queries associated with each edge that you've added so far. So once you do that, you make the edge solid, and your eventual goal is to have a solid edge path to the goal region. Okay. Um, the main um, uh, manipulation that's done here algebraically or mathematically is to make sure that the nodes that you sample are uniform so that eventually you have a probabilistically complete uh, guarantee. Okay. And uh, this approach has also been applied to various uh, interesting tasks. So here we see the SEMO robot which has different modes of operation. So it can do things like push with its hand or it can just walk. Right? And um, the PTR method actually succeeded in finding a plan to push, which is, which is very good because it's using very few heuristics. It's actually using only preconditioned uh, tests as its high-level reasoning. It's not doing nothing beyond it. And then there's an example where it's unstacking a tower of blocks. Okay. So to summarize what we've seen about PTRs, the input requirements here are something like an SAS problem specification with motion planning queries embedded inside them. Um, it does need generators for arguments that satisfy geometric preconditions, like the grasp is stable, so give me a set of uh, valid grasps that are stable. That essentially limits the branching factor. And then um, the main properties are it's probabilistically complete, like Asimov. It does need to store the state of a motion planning query, so your motion planner needs to support that. It can commit to a value that is infeasible. So there's no backtracking. It can fix. It says that I'm going to use this grasp, and later on it can run into a situation where that grasp is not good for putting something down, for instance. And it won't be able to solve that problem. So the probabilistic completeness comes with the assumption that this is never going to happen. OK? Um, right, so there's a minimal use of task specifications. And the main thing uh, suggested improvement for performance here was to add some kind of an automated heuristic synthesis, and which could in particular use Asimov-like ideas. So at the high level, this is similar to Asimov, except that now the high-level reasoning is just a precondition test, nothing more than that. And it can use any uh, any motion planner at the low level as long as the state of the motion planning query could be stored if it, was, um, if it was probabilistic. At the high level, it requires these numeric predicates. So that's different. And it also has a different high level language. Um, incidentally, it's important to generalize beyond PRMs and RRTs because nowadays you also have uh, motion planners that are based on convex optimization. So then you could use those. Yeah. Sorry. 
explaining the, uh, the uh, PTR, you mm -hmm. said that it launches uh, a branch for every possible high-level action. But exactly where in the space does it go? I mean, it's a continuous space. Right. So it does an expansion. Um, so it applies the FX. It gets the logical next state using the action itself. Right? But to get the actual geometric state corresponding to it, it has to complete this query. If it doesn't reach the end, that's still a dotted edge. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at some planners that do a much greater utilization of high-level reasoning. And uh, the first thing we're going to look at is an approach based on hierarchical task networks. Okay. So um, we've all seen HTNs before, or most of us have seen HTNs before, and they, they have seen wide applicability in many applied planning domains because you can use them to specify domain knowledge and so on. Right? But the problem is that it's still hard to apply HDNs if your operators have continuous arguments. So this work is specifically directed towards addressing the branching factors and so on. Okay. Now, the main idea here is that when we use high-level actions like picking up something, instead of providing a declarative specification in a language like PDDL, we just give a procedural specification. So pickup has a certain routine written in whatever language, and when you execute it, it's going to do whatever it does. So you don't have a declarative specification, but you have something like a network here, like the task network. So this one is simply saying that if you want to take object or to the goal, you basically need to do picking it up and then placing it in some region. right? And that P is a, a continuous argument. And then to pick up something, you want to tuck your arms, move your base, and then that's again something with continuous arguments, and then go and pick up the object where again you have a bunch of different um, primitive actions to execute. So everything that doesn't have an edge coming out of it is a primitive action here, and that means that it corresponds to a subroutine that you want to actually execute in the configuration space. Okay. So. In this work, the state is going to be, again, an exact configuration of the robot and all the objects. And the action application is going to take place in terms of applications of or executions of subroutines. Okay. So one assumption that's made here is that we'll fix the random seed for any calls to the motion planner. So that gives you a graph-like sampled configuration space where every time you have a state and if you apply pickup, you're only going to end up in one possible result state. Okay. And your basic problem is to search that space using the knowledge given in the HDN. Okay. So to make this discrete, what's done is uh, for each argument, action argument, you, you sample a pre-specified number of actual values. So this entire thing becomes a discrete search. It's just a very huge discrete search space. So the search algorithm is doing the following. For every, in, for every instantiated high-level action in the plan, you go ahead and recursively compute and store the best cost plan for the reachable states. And this is a table because for every high-level action, you can have multiple refinements because the lower actions can have their own arguments, which they might have a choice for. And then you go ahead and apply each refinement to compute the action effects. OK, so this is going to generate huge state tables. So the main optimization that's done here is to store all states that are similar with respect to an action in just one entry. For example, if your action is to pick up object O1, then it doesn't matter where the other objects are. So you just want to store that effect once for every um, state that has the same configuration of O1. Okay. And the good thing here is because it's doing this best cost plan storage, it actually has an uh, asymptotic optimal guarantee. And you can see that in this video where the robot basically has to take all these bottles and place them in various locations in that other table. And it manages to do that in just one circuit. So it doesn't do any turning around or about turns while doing this.
notice how um, it's picking things up by increasing its height. It's something a human would never plan to do. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> yes, so the alternative, the analog for human would be to put something by going down. <laughs> so, okay, any questions on this so far? Oh, um, so they're using procedures which just call RRTs at the bottom. So those procedures are not optimal, but um, because the random seed is fixed and so on, you always get the same result. But in the results that you get, you will get the optimal plan. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to summarize this here, the basic input you need is a hierarchical task network. You don't really need declarative specifications of actions. Um, you also need sample sets of values for each action argument to describe the state space. Um, the main thing is here that we're building out a sample state space, right? And we're storing each configuration or each state ex explicitly with all the continuous values. Um, and it gains significant advantages by doing uh, intelligent bookkeeping by making use of relevance of states with the actions. And you can't argue with optimality in the limit. So that's, that's a great property here. And, um, so to improve the performance here, you could do various things. You could, do, you, you could utilize some kind of high-level heuristics. There's hardly any heuristic search going on here. Uh, and that you could use declarative specifications, which are even approximate, even that would help. And then controlling the size of the state space, of course. If you start sampling, then that's a risk. So the optimality is finding the best possible refinement, right? Yes, exactly. That's a good point, yes. So it's not going to find the optimal solution, but the optimal solution permitted by the HDN. Yeah. So at the high level, this is the first planner that we are seeing that has a dual search in the sense that there's some kind of logical reasoning going on, which is actually expanding the low level search. Um, its high level reasoning is basically expansion or refinement of the hierarchical task network. And it can use any motion planner. It does need a numeric high level specification. So if you wanted to use a task planner there, it would have to support it. And it has its own HDN uh, language. Okay, so the next few approaches that we're going to look at are all going to be doing this kind of a dual search where you have two layers of search going on. Okay, so in the previous uh, work, the HDN work, we saw how the hier hierarchy was being used, but there was hardly any declarative specification. So in the HPN uh, framework, this is addressed. So you have some kind of a declarative specification and the main problems that we're trying to address, just to recap, are that you have actions with continuous arguments, which leads to an infinite branching factor. And you have preconditions that also have continuous arguments. So you cannot write the whole state out. OK. So the HPN idea is don't worry about abstracting the state. Right? Plan over geometric fluence. And to do logical reasoning over geometric fluence, you can use some custom geometric reasoning subroutines. Right? So for high level reasoning, you can use regression of these geometric fluence and we'll see what that means. Now, when you start doing regression, if your horizon is very high, then your search process becomes inefficient. So you can use an operation, uh, an operator abstraction hierarchy. That addresses some of the efficiency, but then it becomes difficult to refine plans. Um, and so for that, what you do is interleave refinement with execution. Okay, so here is a sample problem. Uh, you want that block A to be in the goal region, but B is occupying it, right? So you can compute these fluents swept A, which is going to be, which represents the area that, so this is a 1D example, by the way. So swept A, or this region of the area is going to be the volume that is going to be used up in the traversal of block A from its initial position to the goal position that you came up with. And then you basically want to say that that region has to be free. So anything that's in that region has to be moved out, right? And this is the basic regression kind of reasoning. So you find that swept volume, 
then you go ahead and find something that would clear it so you could apply that action. So you would first move B and compute its swept volume. And if there is no intersection there, you can move B and then go ahead and place A there. Okay, so this is very um, uh, precise kind of geometric reasoning that's going on here. And to specify these uh, kinds of actions, you basically need geometric fluence. So in this example, we have uh, the in predicate, which tells us that the object O is completely inside a certain region. Right? We have an object location, which gives the exact location of the object. So this can be a full robot configuration if your object is a robot. Uh, you have clear X, which says that only objects in the set X are in the region R. Right? Now, your action like place, saying place O in this uh, target location, will cause this predicate, and it requires the clear X of swept volume. So this is a subroutine that will compute the swept volume if you were to put uh, object O from L in it to L target. Okay, so that's roughly the kind of input that you would require to provide here for such actions. And we'll see a much more precise specification of those actions here. Um, and then you need these ramification actions. So in OR is a ramification action which will just imply the fluent in OR if that uh, geometric property holds. Okay, so we'll also see lots of ramification actions, but um, the use of the entire thing will become clear in a few slides. Okay, so without a hierarchy, first you can specify how regression works. And to specify actions without arguments, uh, without hierarchies, you basically want your actions to consist of the sub goal that you're currently going to go towards. So remember, this is going to be regression planning. So you always have a notion of which sub goal you're going to try to achieve. So you take that as your input. You take S now, which is in uh, refinement, that's going to be your current state that you want to refine from. And place O L target, that's the target that you want to, target location where you want to place the object. Okay, so we see the effect is going to be something that's straightforward. The interesting thing is this choose operation here, which says that if your object has to be an L target, then you need to choose a starting location. And you need, you need to choose this because you want to do regression. So you need to select a starting location appropriately. And this is simply saying it could either be the current location of the object, or you can generate locations in some key regions. right? And that's a location generator. So this action basically has to be instantiated for every choice of L start. Okay? So this is something that you don't see in forward chaining planners that you need to select something for the initial condition. But now the precondition can be specified in terms of L start, that your object O is an L start, and you need the swept volume to be clear. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Okay. Okay. So here's uh, the basic regression algorithm. Take your sub goal, generate all the previous regression states, and do A star search using that. Right? The heuristic for A star is uh, the number of goal fluence that are not true in the state that you've generated. So you can go ahead and do this. So this is a simple specification of actions. You want, in this domain, you want cooked to hold for something. Right? And for that, you need that thing to be washed. And to wash something, it has to be in the sink. And that's where all the geometric reasoning comes in. So this is the result of uh, regression planning in this domain. Uh, that's the key for the different colors, which are not showing up. So cooked is blue over there. And that's a goal. So now you start doing regression planning. So you know that cooked is achieved by the action cook. So you, uh, you can apply the cook action here. And um, then you can do regression for cook. So to be, for something to be cooked, the precondition is that uh, it has to be clean and in the stuff. Right? So that basically brings in the in predicate, because you need to regress the in property over there, the geometric property. So you regress the in, and to achieve an in, you need a place operation, because only place operations have the in property in their effects. And you keep going that way. So every time you do regression, 
you have the logical regression and you have the geometric regression for any geometric fluence that you want to achieve at the end of the action. And then you can produce a whole plan this way. Yeah, so they don't use an admissible heuristic. So you don't have the optimality guarantee, but that's just the search algorithm. Okay, so it's still useful to have it even. Right, you can use any heuristic there. Yeah. Sorry? Then it's just called A, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, because your planning horizon can be huge, you want to use some kind of a hierarchy. And this is where all the numbers attached to the preconditions come in. So the basic idea here is to build a hierarchy by postponing certain preconditions. So for any operator O with preconditions P1 through Pn and some effect, you can say, okay, here's my abstract version of the operator, where I'm going to say the preconditions are just P1 through Pn minus one, and then the expansion of this or refinement of this operation is going to be the task of achieving Pn while maintaining everything, maintaining P1 through Pn minus one. And then I'm going to go ahead and execute O. So given any ordering of preconditions, so those numbers there are ordering, you get an abstraction hierarchy of operators, okay? Now, when you do this, when you say that, okay, I need to achieve Pn while maintaining all these other preconditions, you could basically use any action there. And that action could create additional effects that are not effects of O alone. So you need to declare something for the side effects of operations, of abstracted operations. Okay, so that defines a hierarchy. Now we need to figure out how to uh, solve the problem with such a hierarchy. Is this clear? Because there's going to be a caveat now. Because we did something like operator or precondition postponement. And that's basically a way of doing sub-goal ordering. And if you do sub-goal ordering, then the standard trap is Sussman's anomaly, right? Uh, you start off with this configuration of blocks, and you want to achieve this configuration. Now, depending on how you order the goals, you can end up not really solving the problem. But HPN doesn't get stuck in this. And to see that, let's take an example where we are postponing the clear precondition. So at the high level, we want those two goals on AB and on BC, right? So first, we are looking, going to look at the actions without the clear precondition. So that's the regression we get here, right? So we're saying move A from somewhere onto B and move B from somewhere onto C. Now the refinement strategy here is going to be depth first with the left branch, right? So you go ahead, you refine this action. So in the next step, you say, okay, I need to achieve on BC to achieve the effects of that action, right? Now, every time you introduce a version of the same action with the same arguments, you're going to increase the level of refinement. So this guy now says, move B from table to C, right? You can go ahead, refine that action, which is just the primitive operation of moving. And the moment you reach a primitive, you execute it. So that's the now aspect of this hierarchical planning in the now. So you execute this, now you go back and start looking at the remaining high level actions that you haven't refined so far. That's going to be your move A, B, right? And you propagate the goals that have to hold here after application of that action. So the important thing here is all the goals get propagated, right? So regardless of what you do here, if the domain is reversible, if the domain doesn't have dead ends, you're going to end up finding a new plan which achieves both of those effects. So this is an example where the hierarchy didn't exactly help, but it also didn't get the planner stuck. So basically what happens is you first undo that operation, move B back to the table, then move C to the table, and then move B to C. So you solve the problem, although you execute a slightly suboptimal action there. Any questions? Okay. So what I described just now is the main refinement loop in uh, HPN. Uh, you take your current state, your sub-goal, and alpha is your abstraction level, right? And then there's a world model. So you compute some kind of a plan with, based on regression for that goal at using ap operators at a certain level of abstraction. And then for every 
uh, action and goal in that plan, if, it, if the action is primitive, you execute it. Otherwise, you recursively replan for it or refine that action. Okay? So let's look at a more detailed example here. So this is back in the cooking domain, and we want something to be cooked. So you start with your goal, and you start doing your regression. Right? So in A0, you look at preconditions that are marked 0. So there's no precondition, so you can just cook. Then you go ahead and try to achieve the effects um, that cook will produce, which is cooked A again. Right? Now, because for cooked A, now you, when you introduce cook, you introduce the first level of refinement of cook. And the first level of refinement has clean as a precondition. So you add wash. But this is the first time you're adding wash, so you add the zeroth level of refinement. And then you basically continue that process. Um, so let's look at a different portion of the tree. To clean, for instance, you had to wash something. And to wash something, it has to be in the stove, or sorry, in the sink. And uh, for that, you need to do a pick in place. And for that, you need to clear the region because the main part of this problem is that there's something obstructing the path between uh, the initial location of A and the sink. Right? But geometric regression goes ahead and figures out that, OK, this is the region that you need to clear. And then these are the pick and place operations that you can execute to clear a particular region. OK, so that's the overall structure. Now, to make the whole process more efficient, there are some additional inputs that you can provide and that HPN will use. So the first is you can use object-specific generators to reduce the branching factor. So every time you have an action which has a continuous argument, you say, OK, this is the sub-goal, and here's the property it has to satisfy. Give me a bunch of valid arguments. Right? Now, one thing that's being assumed here is that every time you generate a sub-goal, the sub-goal will be feasible. You'll be able to solve it. And in order to do that, or in order to generate only feasible sub-goals, HPN uses a limited form of logical reasoning, which is going to tell it just whether or not a particular state is consistent. And consistency here means domain-wide integrity constraints. Like, you cannot simultaneously have a block on top of or two blocks on top of each other or something like that. Right? And then you need uh, uh, these additional effects, the side effects, whenever you're postponing preconditions. So you can declare approximations or versions of those side effects. OK, here are a few test domains with HPN. This is a complicated cooking example where the robot needs to do a bunch of cleaning, washing, and cooking. And there are obstructions, and the plan that uh, HPN produces actually successfully manages to remove objects. Here's, uh, this is a PR2 video that was actually going to be shown by Sachin, uh, but he's not going to be able to make it. So um, what this is doing is basically starting off in a situation where the robot has a very loose estimate of where it is. And based on the estimates of where the objects are, it actually figures out where to look. And look, it moves its hand out on its own. And then it swaps the locations of various objects. So it finds out um, where the object has to be placed in intermediate positions. And this loop is actually executing a series of goals where you first swap them, then you place something next to it so that there's a second obstruction, move obstructions out. And this demo is really a demo for belief space planning. But I thought it was interesting to see it in action anyway. Um, now, more recently, I uh, found this other approach by the same group, which is going to be um, presented at Wafer in, a, I think, a month or two, which solves a much more constrained problem. So here we have this uh, configuration of blocks, and each um, non-red block has a target location. So it has to figure out how to remove everything, where to place it. And then move to the target location. So here we have many more such um, objects which have to be placed at their goal locations. And it seems to be doing pretty well. And this, this version or this approach is actually uh, slightly different from HPN. So it's using a geometric heuristic 
um, and extending a, a search space. So it's not doing the hierarchical planning, but I'm not going to be able to go into the details here. So to go back and summarize HPNs, um, what we need are correct and complete primitive action definitions. Okay. And these definitions can use geometric predicates. So you have flexibility of providing that. Uh, you also need operator-specific regression functions for geometric properties and pose generators that help you uh, narrow down the space of possible action arguments. That's sufficient to run HPN. For efficiency, you can provide additional input. You can provide pose generators that make use of the current sub-goal and give you argument choices that are more likely to succeed. Uh, you can add precondition levels and obtain a hierarchy. If you do that, you also want to include limited logical reasoning and side effect descriptions. Uh, the main property is that this approach is complete if the problem has no dead ends and if the action preconditions are accurate. And by that, what we mean is that the motion planners should terminate and return solutions whenever the preconditions hold. Okay? And uh, one thing that, you, uh, that could be done here to actually improve the performance or to make it uh, even more robust is to have post generators being learned from examples and uh, as well as regression functions and precondition levels being learned. Why just post generators? I mean, don't you need generators for where the place is Oh, yeah, yeah. So by post generators, I mean generators for all actions because everything basically returns a pose. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so to go back to the big picture again, uh, we see a dual search here. There's a high level search based on logical predicates and there's a low level search in the sense that the motion planners are actually called when you go down to the primitives. Uh, the main reasoning um, idea is regression and it can use any motion planner. It does require a numeric high level and the high level language is uh, uh, HPN description language, which is, it doesn't have a name, so I'm just placing HPN there. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is a great summary, uh, but I was wondering if there's any performance results. Um, so, if I'm a robot assistant, like you said in the beginning, mm -hmm. we, I still script everything. Mm -hmm. I want to get out of the scripting business and use one of these guys. Uh, how do I know which one to use? Um, unfortunately, it isn't really possible to compare the different approaches in terms of performance because, first of all, there are no standard benchmarks. And that's not a huge problem because right now, as you can see, the inputs are very different. So which approach you want to use might be eventually determined by the kind of input you can provide. Right? And almost, well, the, most of the... Um, Dual search routines have comparable performance except for HTNs, but they require very, they vary a lot in terms of the input that you need to provide. So when you say comparable performance? Like in the sense that uh, it wouldn't be surprising if they solved each other's problems. Actually, well, I should qualify that. Uh, one of the approaches that we're going to talk about an HPN uh, and actually FFROB uh, have similar performances, but yeah, there's no formal test or formal kind of competition. Yeah. Okay, so now I'd like to take a slight break from combined task and motion planning and talk about a different kind of an approach for just a couple of slides, simply because I think it would be interesting in this audience. So, so far we've just looked at uh, goal specification in terms of predicate properties to be achieved and so on. Uh, in this approach or LTL MOP, what you do is provide some kind of a description of the behavior you want to see, okay? And that, uh, after that you do LTL synthesis, uh, which, is, which is a standard approach based on the ability to do LTL synthesis for GR1 formulas, and then that gives you a controller, you go ahead and execute the controller. So you start with an abstraction of the problem domain. So this is not really integrated task in motion planning in the sense that your abstraction doesn't change based on low level constraints or anything. Okay, but you specify the behavior and you get a controller that does exactly what you want. 
So here is a, a oops. That's odd. Oh well. Okay. So this is quite an amusing video. So there is the robot. It's been told to patrol the corners and if you find a missing item close. So it found a missing item. Okay, maybe the audio is interesting as well. So it goes ahead and alert. And then the behavior specification is continue patrolling the corners, so it's going to do that. So it determines when the problem is unsolved. <laughs> okay. I found a missing item. So in this specification, it has to go and try to attract attention at that spot mark takes. Okay. So this is a different kind of a problem specification that that would also be interesting to look at, but so far combined task and motion planning approaches haven't looked at solving these problems. Okay, going back to the topic. Uh, the next approach that we're going to look at is an approach for uh, motion planning with a high level causal region, reasoner that's much more sophisticated. And this reasoner is going to be able to use uh, arbitrary constraints as well as uh, geometric predicates. So. For instance, here's a specification of the problem. It's very much like what you would do if you were writing a SAT instance of the problem. You're saying things like you cannot uh, pick up something if you're already holding something. And then there's a bunch of additional geometric effects that you're saying. So for instance, this, is guy, this set of specifications is saying exactly what the configuration of the payload will be if you start, if you execute the holding operation. Okay. Um, now, uh, your specification can include external predicates, like uh, if there's a collision, uh, then you get into an unsolvable state. And these are basically external calls in your reasoning system. If it can support such external calls, then you can provide such a specification. And the advantage is you can also get concurrent solutions here. So um, I'm running out of time, so I won't get into too many details here, but the basic idea is you find a task planner, uh, or you find a task plan using the constraints that you've got. And the, um, the main issue here that you want to watch out for is you need a discretized task level problem specification, which can go out of hand. So what they do is use a modified RRT, and the main algorithm is to either um, refine each action in the motion plan until you reach the end of the plan, or when you uh, reach a situation where the motion plan is not found, you add a constraint like this, which is saying that if your um, payload configuration was something, and if the payload configuration of uh, payload four was something else, then you are actually going to result in a collision or you find no solutions. The important thing is that you need to be able to include exact uh, configurations in this kind of a constraint report. Right. So, in later work, of course, what was done here is to develop an adaptive discretization method. So, and this was specific to cluttered tables. So what you can do is actually execute this task where you want to swap the red object's location with the gray object. Okay, so this is able to do some kind of geometric reasoning as well. Okay, so actually let me ask quickly here. So for those of you who came in late, 
The second part of the tutorial, which was going to be on belief space planning, is not going to be there because Sachin was going to present it, wasn't able to make it. Uh, so we have two options. Either I can try to wrap up everything here in the next five minutes. Um, there is some interesting stuff. Um, or I can proceed into the second slot and use up whatever we have for the second slot, which would be about maybe 15 or 20 minutes of the second slot. So a rough, a show of hands. Who wants the tutorial to end in the next five minutes? Who would appreciate that? It's perfectly fine. It's doable. So it's your preference. <laughs> and who would like the tutorial to go on in the next portion? Okay, great. Just go on for 15 minutes? Yeah, 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah, after a short break. Yeah. Then go into a workshop or something? Then it's up to you. <laughs> Freedom of choice. <laughs> okay, so in that case, um, Here's a more, in terms of entertainment value, this is probably the most fun video that you'll see. Um, so you have charger robots and worker robots, and there's some pit area over there, and that's your assembly line, okay? Okay, and there's a docking process, and you'll see a lot of concurrency here. Observe that there are those charger robots charging the worker <laughs> robots simultaneously. Okay, so this work was done with a discretized high level and guided replanning, where every time you find that a motion plan doesn't work, you provide the constraints to the constraint solver. Okay, so to summarize this approach, uh, what we need basically is a causal theory of actions with geometric constraints. And the reasoner should be able to support external predicates or make calls as necessary. Right? You can use an arbitrary motion planner underneath, and there are various options for how you want to compute the geometric predicates. You can either pre-compute them all, which is going to be intractable, or you can do an interleaved uh, process where you incrementally find motion plans uh, corresponding to task plans, and if they fail, you add the constraints, or you can compute them directly as constraints in the low level, re in the high level reasoning process. Um, there are various extensions. The discretization issue is been, has been addressed using some domain specific methods for cluttered surface tasks, and the authors also uh, speculate about using TL plans so that you, they can incorporate domain specific knowledge to solve these problems. Okay. So going back to the high level summary, this is also a dual space uh, planner. You need your um, high level reasoning to use, uh, well, it, it, this approach uses a causal reasoner plus some external support for external predicates. It works with any motion planner. It does require a high level uh, numeric uh, specification. And the language it uses uh, in this work was CCALC, but it has also been done with some other ASP solvers. Okay, so if you guys want to take a break, this is a good time to stop. We can uh, resume in 10 minutes. So when you resume, we're going to finish this? Yes. Keep the uncertainty files? Yes. So the first approach we want to look at now is uh, planning with semantic attachments. It has very much uh, the same flavor as CCALC that we saw last. Uh, again, you can have uh, in your PDDL, like domain specification, external modules. So you can have condition checker modules, which tell you whether or not a certain condition holds. Um, and you can have effect app applicator modules, which tell you, uh, which basically tell you which procedure you want to execute to find out the effect of an action, okay? And then you can, uh, there is a particular syntax that you can use to provide um, action descriptions in the enhanced PDDL language, okay? Now, the interesting thing is once you provide these rich descriptions, uh, you need to change the planner because the planner now needs 
to be able to call these external predicates or procedures to determine the truth values of facts as it's doing the search. So this has been done with FF, uh, fast forward, and um, apparently that was pretty straightforward, but it was harder to do it for temporal fast downward because it uses a very different action, uh, uh, action representation or even state representation. And then once this kind of a bridge has made, the uh, basic search algorithm remains whatever the planner was using. So the only difference is instead of using the PDDL definition to find out what the next state is, you do a procedure call. Okay. Um, now the two main assumptions here are that the condition checkers and effect applicators are stable so that if you give them the same input, you're going to get the same output again. So that means there's no randomness or in other words, you fix the random seed if there's randomness. And the second is that these condition checkers will always be terminating. So you'll always get an answer. So this prevents uh, the effect applicators from making any choices and it uh, makes them all deterministic. Okay, so the branching factor in, uh, in the search tree is limited by the condition checkers that are constrained to be unique. So, so you have to get only one satisfying value for every condition. But I think uh, this is not very clear from the work, but it looks like you could do it with bounded lists as well. Um, so here's an example of PSA uh, going ahead and executing the task of clearing the room. Um, so it has all these positions, objects and locations. Note that they're, okay, tried to push the door open, it didn't open. Uh, so it's going to use continual monitoring to figure out what the state is. Now it recomputed the plan, so it's going to drop the bowl that it picked up and again try to open the door. Um, so the overall task is to put everything in one shelf and to clean up all the locations where the objects originally were. And that's its uh, ingenious cleaning scrubbing action. Okay. So Going back to the summary, um, again, we have a dual search here because uh, it uses a motion planner at the bottom to actually execute its actions. Uh, it requires a slightly extended version of the PDL language in its initial specification. And it can use any motion planner, but it does use a numeric uh, high-level input. Okay, so now we'll move on to the last approach and one question that uh, you can ask right now is whether the regular task planners can be used at all for planning in robotics. Because all the approaches that we saw so far either extend the vocabulary of the task planners or just do an enhanced version of motion planning. Right? So can we actually use task planners here or was the whole strips development somehow misled in some way? It turns out that you can use them because if you look at this problem, then Recall that the main challenges were that you have infinitely many facts and the infinite branching factor. And you want a way to plan while avoiding these problems. So intuitively, this can be done by saying that, okay, at the high level, what I want to do is pick up block one after going to block one's grasping pose, right? And that might be something. And you want to go along a certain trajectory, right? So. Just to recap for the newcomers in the audience, what we are doing, trying to do now is uh, solve, the plan, solve the problem using task planners without any extensions, right? So intuitively, what we want to do here is produce a high-level plan which says something like, uh, I'm going to pick up block one, and the way I'm going to do that is go to block one's grasping pose along a certain trajectory. So those things are just symbolic references here. Now, what we need is an interface level which can go ahead and search for instantiations of whatever this block one's grasping pose means and instantiations of the trajectory, right? In this case, it's going to find that there's no feasible trajectory 
because there is no way to grasp block one here. Right? So then what the interface level could do is, okay, fix a trajectory for a particular grasping pose and then return the reasons why that trajectory doesn't work. So in this case, it would say something like block two obstructs block one's grasping pose along the trajectory that I have chosen, right? And that all of these have continuous values, but to communicate this information to the high level, it doesn't need to use those continuous values. It can just use these symbolic references. Right? And these kind of errors could be arbitrary. They don't have to be just obstructions. They can be any kind of an infeasibility of the trajectory. So it could be something like the torque limits are not uh, suitable. Whatever you can relax and find the motion plan, basically. Right? In some examples, we'll see that this can be just stability properties of assemblies. Okay? So now we can include this information in a symbolic uh, um, change at the high level. So let me... So here, for instance, at the discrete state, we can just say, okay, block two obstructs the grasping pose of block one according to some path. And that's exactly the kind of a message that you'd return to the high level. It doesn't need the exact uh, configuration or anything. So then we can go ahead, find a plan for solving the revised state with the obstruction information. In this case, it's reasonably simple, which says, okay, pick up block two, then release block two in the free area, and then pick up block one. Okay, so this simple example assumed that there was a free area where you could drop something and it would no longer obstruct other objects. But that's not necessary for the approach to work in general. So this kind of an idea can be extended to a complete algorithm where the high level idea is you want to maintain a graph of plans. So let's say the objective was to pick up object one and then you're using a PR2 robot so you have left and right grippers, right? So the first plan that you get is saying Okay, go and pick up object one using the right arm grasping pose for the object. Okay, now to expand this node, you can apply two kinds of actions. You can either uh, continue the search for feasible instantiations of all the references. So in this case, that's just right arm grasping pose. You continue the search, and for that, you can use an arbitrary motion planner. So that's one way of spending time in expanding the node. Another thing what you can do is that replan to fix the errors for any previous feasible, infeasible solution that you found. So in this case, for instance, for one particular trajectory and grasping pose instantiation, the obstructions that it found were object 19 and object 21. You can go ahead, give that information to the task planner. In this case, what the task planner said was, okay, forget about the right hand, I'm going to use the left arm to go and pick it up. And in that expansion, that corresponds to a different instantiation of the grasping pose, we got a different plan, which is again using the left arm uh, because it doesn't know that the left arm also has obstructions yet. But then the basic idea is to continue expanding this graph until you reach a plan for which you can find a complete instantiation that's feasible, okay? And you can use various heuristics and daisy chaining for this. So um, this is the graph that we got for a particular test problem. And for succinctness, I'm not showing any put down actions. But basically what it's doing is picking, it first tried to pick up something with the right arm. And then as we saw, it decided, okay, I'm going to use the left arm. Then when it started refining that, it found obstructions with the left also. And finally, it ends up with this plan, which it can refine, which picks up two other objects before going and picking up the uh, uh, object with the left arm. Okay, so here's a, a hard kind of a test problem for this. Uh, basically, we have a cluttered table and we want to pick up this target object, right? There's no free space, so all the objects have to be rearranged over here. And in prior work, this has been addressed using specific approaches that take the geometry into account and do specific reasoning. But uh, we applied the same idea that I showed in this problem without any more geometric reasoning and it goes ahead and figures, up, figures out a plan. Um, so the interesting thing here is we made the problem deliberately hard by telling it you can only pick up things from the side because otherwise it just goes and picks up something from the middle. Um,
Okay. And then finally, get to the block. So in this case, the interface layer was creating that obstruction predicate, as I described earlier. Uh, so to test this on something where obstructions are not the problem, you have some other problems. We applied this on a problem where you want to lay out the dinner table. So you have an initial location of objects, and you have a final location. And there's a tray which you can use if you need to, uh, or if you want to. So the tray is not compulsory. Um, the two interesting things about this problem that are geometric in nature are the relative sizes of objects. So you can only stack smaller objects on bigger ones. And that's something that the high level layer doesn't know about. So low level plans can be infeasible because simply because they're putting a bigger object on top of smaller object. And the interface layer figures that out. There's also a wrong side uh, predicate, which is also geometric. And this is done so that the uh, robot doesn't repeatedly do these operations where to pick up something on the left, it moves all the way and then picks it up on the right and then places it on the wrong side again. So um, those are the two facts that the um, interface layer needs to compute here. So the first thing that the plan does is figures out, okay, it should use the tree. And it does that because we used a cost-based planner and told it there's a big distance between the um, initial location and the final location of objects. So it decides to use the tree. And then it interacts with the low level to figure out that, okay, the, um, this is the right stacking order of objects. Right? And this is where it uses the wrong side. So it's now doing this fancy handoff action, which it could have done any time. So it only increased the complexity of planning. But it knows that you have a high cost. You incur a high cost if you place things on the left with your right hand. So it's now only going to pick up things with its left hand if they're on the right, and only place them with its right hand if they're on the right. And one thing that we didn't expect at this point was for it to find this unique base position that works for everything. Yes. So all of that is a part of the plan. Yeah. So it's, um, well, that shouldn't have happened. Because, yeah, so the sampling for the base is such that it always returns the current base position first. So if it works, it would use that. Yeah. Ah, yeah, so that's a good point. The, there's no guarantee of optimality here. And geometric reasoning is local in the sense, well, it just knows whether or not there's a collision when it's putting things down. So it can put something down. And then later on find that it obstructs a different path and then uh, you know, pick it up and place it back again. So there was a slight difference in that position. Uh, so how does, it, how does it figure out where to place something? Does it just randomly pick, pick Yeah, pick? it's a random backtracking search for the entire plan, for the references. So the target location is a reference. And it has a bunch of values, which is just random on the surface of the table. And it keeps something. I'm sorry? The sampled va set of values? Yeah. No, so they vary with different random seeds. So I guess I'm trying to understand. So, so it's picking these values dynamically. In other words, as it's proceeding with, with planning, it's randomly picking some. Um, let's, uh, let's, this is good. So let's look at this plan, right? At that point, when it said pick up, uh, it chose a certain grasping pose. It went ahead and tried to execute it, got this obstruction and so on. Um, so in this plan, so it's doing a pick up with the left arm, then pick up with the right arm, and then there's a put down in the middle that I'm not showing, and then a pick up, right? So that entire four action plan has some references, which are specifically the grasping poses and the put down locations. So it tries to search for a feasible instantiation for the entire plan. It spends some time there. If it doesn't find anything, it can you know, either expand another node or try to 
fix the problems with that. And in this case, it found something here. For the grasps, we have object-specific grasp generators, post generators, which generate, for instance, for this mug, it would generate uh, eight or so grasping poses around that. And for cylinders, it would do the same thing. Um, for table locations on a surface, we just do a, a random ser search or a random sample anywhere on that surface. It doesn't even know what the collisions are or where the objects are. But clearly, you could use geometric heuristics and make that much more efficient. Sure. sure. Yeah. Is this, um, since there's an infinite number of places you could put the objects down, uh, and you're not going to generate those in advance, do you, do you generate one? Do you, do you generate some, some like five random samples, make those your successors, but then you could come back to this state? Um, no, we gen generate them incrementally, actually. So we have generators. So this is in Python. It incrementally creates you a new location every so time you call it. To that state. So like yes. State, you yes. One, you right. You decide, you right. So you have to store the state of the post generators right. in the plants. So each of these nodes has not just the task plan, but also the state of the instantiation search, so that you can proceed from there. Yeah. To leave? Yeah. So, in this, um, we we tried multiple strategies. Here, we are just following the nose kind of thing, keep going down. Um, but you could do various kind of iterative deepening, breadth first search, or you know, um, you could use costs. You could use plan costs to determine for because every time you try a bunch of instantiations, you know what the um, range of costs so far are. So you could use that to decide which node you want to expand. So, but currently we haven't explored that too much. Uh, okay. so. It has to be somewhat heuristic driven, right? Yes. For search, you just keep expanding yeah, place. yeah, exactly. So, breadth first won't work here at all. You need some kind of iterative deepening and then, okay. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Um, okay, so that was the table layout task. Okay, to, symbol, uh, to summarize this, what we need as input is a PDDL domain with references instead of continuous values. And we found that that's easy enough to write down, but there is also some theory on how you can generate it automatically from a complete specification of the domain. Uh, we require generators for instantiating references um, and also subroutines for determining, given a motion plan, whether it's infeasible and why it's, infe why it's infeasible, for instance, that there's a certain obstruction along the way or that it's putting something smaller on bigger, uh, something bigger on something smaller and so on. Um, it's probabilistically complete because every time it goes and spends more time on uh, stuff that it tried before. And one interesting aspect here is that because we only store the facts corresponding to a particular instantiation in any uh, task planner invoca invocation, all the task planner invocations have a small branching factor and states only have a relevant subset of the facts for the current instantiation. So there's the state space explosion doesn't quite occur here because discretization doesn't make it to the high level. In the high level, there's just one grasping pose for, every, for each object. Um, the obvious places where uh, performance improvements could be made here is uh, through geometric heuristics for figuring out where to place things, where to, uh, what you need to be clear and so on. None of that is being done currently. As well as statistical learning for post generators, which is like, uh, uh, it, it extends something like the general version of the grasping problem because now you want to figure out which, pose, which poses are going to be good in the long run and so on. And also, um, the question that you just raised that uh, we need domain independent heuristics for figuring out how to expand the search, the search frontier. So going back to the overall summary, again, we have a dual search space because we are having the uh, low level and high level search. It can use any task planner and any motion planner. It doesn't require numeric high level and the input language is just PDDL. 
Okay, so this was meant to be a bridge slide for such in stock. Um, and we'll have the slides for such in stock. So I'm not going to spend too much time over here except to motivate you to go and check out such in slides when they're available. So in the real world, of course, full uh, situations are never fully observable. And you have a lot of non-determinism. For example, if you want to do the laundry, you have that heap of clothes over there. You don't know how many clothes there are in it. And you don't know how many you'll grasp at each point. So you still need to find a plan that is going to terminate and solve the problem. So in some of our ongoing work, we've been using uh, ideas from that symbolic interface and some earlier work on generalized planning to solve this problem. So the, um, here, the robot at every point detects whether there are still clothes there or not. And the plan tells it when to detect and where to look and so on. And it does a redetection before every operation and replans to take care of the noise and so on. And it goes ahead and does the laundry. So this works with any number of clothes and any pipes. And we tried a lot of variations of the uh, number of clothes and so on there. Um, so with that, let me conclude. Um, if there's one thing that you can take away from this tutorial is that there are two main challenges in combined task and motion planning. One is that you now have actions that have continuous arguments, right? And you need some way of limiting the branching factor. And the second is that you have geometric preconditions and effects which make your state infinite, uh, infinite dimensional. So you need some way of controlling that. And so far, the popular approaches for resolving them are nearly unanimous on how to deal with continuous action arguments. Almost everyone is using some kind of a post generator in all the approaches that we looked at. However, most of them are currently handwritten. So learning a good post generator is an obvious direction where this can be improved. Um, for dealing with geometric preconditions and effects, there's a huge range of approaches, varying from just ignoring them and just using task planners as heuristics. So don't worry about what actually, um, what the accurate effects are. Right? Or you could use custom geometric reasoning functions, which are specific to the domain and even to the task if you want them to be. Um, or you can extend the high level reasoner to use external calls to figure out the values of these um, geometric preconditions and effects. And finally, we also saw an approach where we have dynamic evaluation of the relevant facts and then forgetting to include daisy chaining and so on. Okay, so I'll stop here if there are any questions. Thank you. Any questions? OK, so you're all going to be trapped here for the next 40 minutes because the tutorial is going to continue, right? <laughs> OK, so if there are no more questions, we can stop here.